So, good evening. Uh, I'm on day five of uh, Proline, and it's killing me. I'm just kidding. I feel great. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> I have finished my uh, last meal on it, and uh, I didn't, didn't take all the teas, and I didn't take all of that glycerin. At some point, I probably should talk about uh, glycerin. I think that's one of his magic uh, bullets. Glycerin is what holds together uh, triglycerides. A triglyceride is three fatty acids held together by a glycerin molecule. So if you're burning fat, in other words, if you have ketones, you're also going to have glycerin in, that your body's making. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm going off down a down a bunny hole, and let me let me come back to where we are. Um, I finished all the the foods, and I feel really good. Um, We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, one thing I decided, th this is my first week of ever doing uh, YouTube Live. I told myself a couple of years ago I needed to do it, just never got around to it. Uh, these have been very well received. I appreciate the interest. Um, and I'm planning to go ahead and start doing some, um, uh, hopefully one a week. And I'd like to get it on a scheduled uh, time. Now I know uh, I know a lot of folks do this on Sunday night. Um, I uh, help teach our Sunday school, and we just went through uh, the Ten Commandments. And a few months ago, I started focusing again on uh, not working on Sundays because I've worked a lot of Sundays in my life as a physician. Obviously, uh, you have to, but I don't have to now. So I'd rather not it not be on Sunday, and it clearly can't be uh, Sunday morning. So please, uh, number one, let me know if you'd like uh, like to have a routine weekly um, YouTube live. Number two, um, if so, what time what time slots work well for you? And number three, what are some good topics that you're interested in? Uh, we're going to cover some just very very brief, very high level uh, cardiogenetics. I mentioned those, and I had a I had a couple of comments. One comment on my uh, blood spike to uh, blood sugar spike up to 200, which we'll talk about a couple of times tonight. And the other one on genetic markers, uh, the first from Clint Shelton and the other one from Nathan uh, Petty. So I'm going to cover a little bit more detail about genetic markers. And um, I've got a series of those, but again, we'll talk about those later. So here we go. Proline day five. Uh, how do I feel? Gosh, I feel really good. I've felt really good the past two and a half days. And in fact, I keep thinking about uh, adding another, extending it for another couple of days with just a water fast. I probably won't do that because I love to eat. Um, that's just part of my culture. Um, <clears throat> I slept really well. I, it, the, this was very different from the other times that I've done Proline. Um, I didn't sleep well uh, other times. I just, day four really was just uh, a challenge the, uh, most of the other times. But those were all a couple of years ago. They were long before I got um, focused and uh, re really um, disciplined with my um, low carb. So I think, uh, I think maybe some of this is uh, because of... Uh, I started getting back into um, a light ketosis. Um, there's another thing that it could be. Uh, I knew I was going to be doing the F FMD this week. I knew it was going to be a five day. And I knew that I really wasn't going to be doing a lot of high intensity interval training or uh, re significant resistance training during this five day period. I know a lot of people have. Um, and I theoretically could, but I wasn't going to because I also knew this was I was this was going to be the first time I I um, did like a, a fasting mimicking diet event, a prolon event, and helped. Um, so I knew I would be talking about it. So I didn't want to be totally uh, drug out. So it could have been just those first two and a half days. Maybe some of that was uh, getting used to carbs again, or maybe it was. Um, uh, getting used to a significant decrease in calories, or maybe it was um, the domes, uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. It wasn't domes. It would maybe it was just some recuperation from the work workout, the high intensity intervals, and the resistance training. 
because I did really, really hard uh, workouts the uh, one day and three days before starting this. We've got, uh, we've got several people. Again, I'm a rookie at this scheduling thing. I thought I had scheduled this already about 12 hours ago. Didn't. Um, I just realized a half, I came to prepare for it a half hour ago and looked, and I'd still not sent the, uh, the thing out. But we've got a lot of people here already. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining. CC starts off with uh, two or three comments um, and questions. Uh, for folks who don't clear caffeine for hours and hours, or for people who drink coffee all day, could this cause people to wind up with more sugar and insulin in their blood? Well, obviously, if they're drinking coffee with a bunch of junk in it, a, a, a bunch of carb-based uh, uh, milks and uh, creamers and a bunch of uh, sugar, for sure. Now, whether or not uh, just caffeine alone would cause an increase in blood sugar, I don't think it, I, I don't know. I don't think it does, but I'm not sure. Uh, CC says, I mean, causing sugar to be elevated for long periods of the day. Uh, no, I don't think it's going to cause uh, uh, just drinking caffeine is not going to cause your blood sugar to be elevated for long periods of day. Even though it it stimulates you, it's not like cortisol. Cortisol will increase your, your blood sugar for long periods of the day. Uh, CC says, good evening and thanks for the video. Helene Louise, uh, greetings, Earthling. Uh, good job on the fast. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump back. We've got several other comments, but I'm going to jump back into some more content that I wanted to cover. As I said, I felt really good the, uh, the, the last two and a half days, not so good the first two and a half days. I took a 10-minute nap at noon on the third day, and that just I just popped up and uh, have felt good ever since. Very calm. Now, um, <clears throat> We talked several times about uh, spikes that I had, and there's no question I had spikes. If you go back, I'm going to show you the um, the daily patterns. Oh, no, that, I don't want to show you. You don't want to see that. The daily graph. Okay, we're going to go back to day... Uh, let me see. May 14th. Was that... One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So day one, I started off doing these as a time restricted thing as well. So I didn't eat breakfast. I just ate uh, lunch and dinner. And you can see when that lunch and dinner happened. Um, just with these soups, these very, um, uh, they're not low carb soups, obviously, and you'll uh, you'll see this in a, in a few minutes. I'm getting spikes. Uh, I don't get nearly that high anymore, unless I'm taking a carb vacation. Let me show you. Um, that's what I usually do. Uh, I had I did get a couple of spikes there because that was my carb vacation before I went on the um, proline diet. Again. Just that was, you know, these are my, t my typical numbers. And then uh, th just these soups are uh, spiking my sugar. So let's go back and look at day two. That spike on mushroom, and somebody made the comment, blood sugar 200 on mushroom soup out of a proline? Yep, that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> didn't get so much of a spike the second uh, meal. So here was the third meal. Still got spikes. I mean, uh, this was day three, I believe. Uh, so day four, another significant spike. It got away from me. I wasn't looking for it. And so since I, I, I expected not to have another one. Um, <clears throat> so today I did something different. I watched the glucometer. And um, this is a Freestyle Libre, by the way. It's a little button that you put on the back of your arm. And you plug it into Libre Link, which is an app for the iPhone and a couple of other phones. And you can monitor your uh, blood sugar and what it does. And I don't know anybody that has not been surprised by these numbers. So, <clears throat> I, you know, I... have I feel very strongly after watching how quickly I went up after those soups um, 
that I was going to head, I was headed for another uh, 180, 200. So when I started hitting about 130, I went out to take a walk. And that's one of the things that I wanted to share with you. One of the things that people learn when they, um, when they start doing continuous glucose monitoring is, look, I can take a, a carb uh, break or a carb vacation, eat more carbs than I usually do. And uh, when I start that spike or even before I start that spike, I can go out and take 15, 20 minute walk and it takes the top right out of the, the spike, brings it right back down. Even exercise that mild is it's effective as insulin and it's a similar process to insulin. And why is that? That's because exercising muscles pull sugar out of the blood and into the muscle. Now, one of the questions might be, well, again, there was a comment. How could you get a blood sugar that high? off of mushroom soup <laughs> well there's 23 carbs in it um yes four of them are fiber and two only two sugars so the rest is complex carbs and you would think dang brewer well and in fact here's one of the comments clint shelton um why would that go up that high i know you're not pre-diabetic well yeah i responded clint yes i'm very pre-diabetic and in fact um the one of the um, ADA definitions of blood sugar is uh, any time over, well, at least uh, one hour uh, post uh, OGTT, or in, some interpretations would be any time over 200. And I did once have a blood sugar uh, uh, measurement over 200, but it was on um, it was on this thing. It was on on um, a Libre. And the Libre is not that accurate. So I could debate whether I have, I'm officially diabetic or just way pre-diabetic. Either way, um, I just shared with you a couple of tips in terms of uh, what you can do in terms of managing your own and making sure that uh, you know your own situation. Now, we talked about those spikes too in terms of uh, ke ketones. So yes, I was uh, mildly ketotic. That was earlier today, and my, at a time when my blood sugar was about 75. That was about, what, two or three hours after my blood sugar was up about 150. And yes, I did, uh, uh, people talk about the Libre being uh, not that accurate. It, it's not that inaccurate either. It's, you, you, you wouldn't want to measure, you wouldn't want to take insulin based on it. You would want to confirm any time, but I've sent, spent several times uh, confirming with this. Uh, it's a freestyle light, so and uh, it's been it's been accurate to the freestyle light anyway. So if you look at when I had, took those numbers, they were down here. So I got that uh, sugar level uh, after my um, so I ate my mush or ate my soup. Today it was minestrone, I think. Started headed up, uh, got up to about 150, and I did a, uh, sorry about that. don't know how we can, here we go. Um, started heading up. I took the a walk, pulled it back down, and about here, right before I ate dinner, that other cup of soup, um, I had a, um, I took my, ketones and my blood sugar. And I had a ketone value of 2.5. Again, mildly ketotic. Now, that's one of the things that confuses some people. How could you have um, uh, a blood spike one minute and then blood uh, and then ketones uh, an hour or two later? I meant to look up how long ketones stay in the body. Um, there's no question I'm ketotic after four days of, uh, of only 600 calories. Uh, so, it, well, some people would ask, well, and, and did ask, well, could this have been ketones prior to that spike? Let me go in and check my uh, blood sugar. The way that's the way you do it is this: click that button that says check glucose. And so now, um, 
that completes that, uh, that second uh, bump on out there. So again, it was between that, um, that second and third bump uh, when it was a little bit lower that I had the 72 blood sugar and the 2.5, excuse me, yeah, 72 blood sugar and the 2.5 um, ketones. So interesting. Um, you know, you can clearly have a really high blood sugar and sig really high ketosis. That's what, I mean, that's diabetic ketoacidosis. And I'm nowhere near that. I'm not worried about that. Uh, in fact, it's very unusual for anybody with a, more of a type 2 uh, diabetes pattern to get that serious. In fact, it's not common for type 2 diabetics to ever even need insulin. But it's very common for people to, to, to start getting insulin resistant as we get older. Uh, in fact, over uh, once you're over 60, even just looking at fasting glucose and, um, and uh, hemoglobin A1C, over half of us are, um, are insulin resistant, again, by age 60. Now, if you started looking more deeply with an OGTT or even a Kraft insulin survey, a lot more are going to pop up as insulin resistant. So again, it's something to know. Um, uh, obvious question would come up. Well, Brewer, if you're that insulin resistant, why are you doing a fasting mimicking diet that's got significant carbs in it? Um, well, you know, you wouldn't think that these are that bad in terms of carbs and the carbs that it does have are complex carbs. Um, here's why two reasons. Number one, I wanted people to under, again, to under, to think about fasting. I've had dozens of people lose 30, 50 pounds. Um, and they typically do it with going low carb and then shrinking that, uh, that eating window. But, um, very few take me up on fasting. I mostly do, uh, water fasting. Now I've been doing for the past six months or so, I've been most weeks I'll do a two day water fast. Uh, but again, I wanted to do a, a campaign awareness campaign and do it myself. I also personally wanted to spread out from this uh, 48, 60 hours for uh, water fast and do more of a prolonged fast to get more of a bump. So, um, <clears throat> and more of a challenge to my epigenetics. We talked about epigenetics, had a couple of comments about that. And if you don't know what that is, uh, I've got a couple of videos on it. And many of us think that epigenetics clearly is a part of what's going on with insulin resistance. Um, I think I will, I will, uh, hold on that for a while and, and deal with some comments and don't let me forget to go to, um, uh, cardiogenetics. Okay. Tim Schaefer, I do hard training and my glucose always stays up even when I'm into keto diet heavy. Thank you for sharing that, Tim. Um, Deb, stay blessed. Hi, question. I'm thin. I do intermittent fasting, 23 one and three most days with 45 minutes on elliptical can individuals like myself gain benefits from fasting yes um uh yes you can uh it depends on how old you are uh the older you get or, or as you start getting past your 40s and into your 50s and 60s there's a significant benefit and again it has to do with some of the things that i've been talking about uh, fasting has also been shown to, um, it has a lot of impact. Let me see if I can find, uh, yeah, okay. So here, here's some of the biological impacts. Um, anti-aging uh, cell mode, it gets the cell into more of an anti-aging mode. It, part of that is called autophagy. It's where the cell is cleaning up. Um, by eating trash that's sitting in the cell that w normally wouldn't get wouldn't would not get eaten, uh, killing uh, damaged cells, um, uh, decreases abdominal and visceral fat. So even uh, thin people can have that, and fasting tends to help that. And I've already mentioned the epigenetic changes. I just got to mention this: uh, if you've ever uh, listened to Jason Fung, he makes this point a lot, and it's a very good point. If you look at uh, religions, 
You know, it's one thing that Jesus, Mohammed, uh, the Jewish leaders, Moses, I think Moses, anyhow, um, I don't remember Moses saying anything about fasting, but uh, clearly it's a part of Jewish tradition, I think. Um, Hindu, Buddhists, one thing that all the large religions in the world, oh, and Confucius too, I think, one thing that all of them agreed on was fasting. Yet you just don't see it that often here. Um, on my, you're starting to see it more and more with health nuts, modern day. But uh, yes, fasting can help. Enthusiastic support for weekly live chats. Uh, evenings preferred, but we'll take advantage of any time. That was Nathan Petty. Thank you, Nathan. In fact, I'm going to be quoting you a little bit later. You asked about uh, genetic markers. Tim Schaefer, been doing keto for a year, and a two-day fast is always so easy. It is. Your body gets hardened to fasting. The first time you fast is the hardest time. And again, um, that was the purpose of the fasting mimicking diet. Uh, Walter Longo, a fellow named Walter, Long, Walter Longo, an Italian, developed it. And um, his purpose for developing it was, um, I think he, I get the impression that he may have been a little bit of a, had a little bit of a slacker mentality, even though he obviously works hard. He's one of the leading researchers in longevity. Um, but his, uh, one of well, his mentor was Roy Walford, um, the, um, the guru of, um, uh, caloric restriction, caloric restriction being long-term decreased calories. They did the biosphere too, um, with, uh, have well about 10 people stayed in a big terrarium in the desert in Arizona for months uh, and again showed very positive impact so uh, again your body does train uh, to uh, fasting and that's one of the reasons I brought this up I can't get people to take me up on fasting a lot of significant weight loss but no prolonged fasting the uh, fasting mimicking diet is a great way to do that first one to start getting your body hardened. Okay, so uh, let me see. Tim Schaefer, I eat chicken broth with duck fat. So good. High in vitamin K2. Actually, <clears throat> I've got a small story to tell about K2. One of my videos, uh, I, I thought I'd done one on K2, but I had not. One of my viewers commented on it, but on K2. So I just did a video on it about a year ago, maybe a year and a half. It quickly became my number two most popular video until last week. And I'm thinking, what in the Dickens happened? We, uh, as you may know, we've been doing some things to change the thumbnails. That wasn't it. Uh, Kim Hermosa, my, uh, our, uh, we have a media manager now. She's in uh, the Philippines. She found that uh, someone else did a Evidently, um, uh, Eric Berg did a, uh, a K2 video about a week ago, and I think that's where the algorithm switched. So I've gotten my competition, competitive juices going. I read the book, uh, K2 and the, the Calcium and Paradox. I originally thought that I was going to be um, critical of that book, and I am critical. I'm going to start doing a series on K2 because it's very, very interesting. Um, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, I a lot more than I thought. So again, uh, that's for the future. Um, <clears throat> Betty Davis, Barry Davis. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm thinking about movie stars. Have you started confirming your spikes with finger sticks? Yes, I have been confirming my spikes with finger sticks, and those are real spikes. Uh, Tim Schaefer, and I'm not surprised. I can't eat. I can't eat the, uh, those kind of carbs. Uh, or I will get spikes. So, I mean, obviously I can, but I know I'll get spikes if I do. So either A, I go ahead and do it for something like this, or B, I do it and know I'm going to be uh, taking a walk or just taking the hit. Or C, as I showed you before, I don't eat those kind of carbs on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> Stuart Jones, how do you test your blood sugar continuously? Well, I... I just showed you. Um, it's an app on your iPhone. But uh, the app is called Libre Link. 
right there. Libre link. Let me see if I can. I don't think I can get a better image of it. L I B R E L I N K. And then you uh, you need to get a prescription still, I think. Then you get one of these little patches. Uh, this will last for two weeks to give me um, a number. Now these are uh, are not the most accurate. The thing that we had before that was called thing called Dexcom five, and Dexcom is far I think probably far more reliable, but it's also a lot more expensive eight hundred to twelve hundred bucks. This is uh, I think these are seventy for three. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's not a lot. You can also, if you don't have an iPhone or another phone with uh, Libre that you can get, that you can download Libre link to, they make little um, um, readers that are about that size. And I think the readers for the 14 day is about 70 as well. They used to have 10 days. They're just, they're phasing out 10 days. They're not selling them anymore. Uh, 10 day buttons. Um, and before the whole thing was like uh, 70 bucks, I think 40 bucks, about 40 bucks for the reader and 30 for the, for a 10 day button. Tarky, you look very young after fasting. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I feel very young. <clears throat> Quincy. Oh, Quincy, dis uh, Quincy. Would you suggest limiting complex carbs if someone has insulin resistance? Yeah, you know, this is a place where I part, and many of us part company with a lot of the diabetes gurus and like the ADA. We think that, our, that the ADA has too many carbs in the recommended uh, ADA diet. And all you have to do is watch your blood sugar it, it, eat to the glucometer. Uh, there's a uh, Jenny Rule, J E N N Y Rule, R U H L, has a couple of good books uh, Blood Sugar 101 and um, Diet 101. She's a diabetic. She runs the, uh, a, a very big uh, diabetes website called Blood Sugar 101. Tens of thousands of diabetics on there, all sharing their um, experience. And that's one of the comments that she'll make over and over eat to the glucometer. It just makes sense. So if something makes you uh, your blood sugar spike up like that, uh, spikes are not really good. Now, to somebody's point, someone asked me earlier, and I'm sorry, I don't see that comment anymore. The question was, does a short-term spike and then coming down quickly, is that as uh, damaging as long-term? Uh, clearly does not appear to be. So if this were, if I didn't know how to manage these spikes with uh, walking, uh, or if I had, uh, like a type one diabetes where it would, the spike would just go up and I wouldn't be able to handle that and I would need insulin. I don't think I'd be doing the, uh, this diet. Now, actually speaking of diabetes and the fasting mimicking diet, prolon diet, it has got great research, um, showing that it does help insulin resistance significantly. And, um, does it help more than other types of fasting? No, it doesn't. I mean, all types of fasting do help insulin resistance. Okay, KBKSQ, KBK Esquire, I guess. The truth is many Americans would never try stopping eating after six or even seven. That in itself would probably help a ton. You got it. That's exactly right. Um, uh, Quincy ST, I'm sure there's a connection between late night eating and insulin resistance. Um, eating late at night is not healthy for you. I mean, there's, you look, uh, I've got a couple of videos on time restricted eating and it's not healthy for you. You, you do want to narrow that window. It is healthy for you to narrow that window. The other thing is, you know, most people that do what, first of all, the, the most common concept of intermittent fasting is skipping breakfast, basically, and then doing what uh, somebody said earlier a few minutes ago, like narrowing the window. But technically, intermittent fasting is more like a five to five, eat normal five days, um, lower calorie or, or no eating for two days. That's more of an intermittent fasting. Um, technically, uh, squeezing that window, which most people just do by skipping breakfast and eating 
uh, lunch at 12 and then something else at six. That's a very common six or eight. Uh, that's a very common narrowed window. If you look at the research, there is something to uh, the fact that it's probably healthier. It would be healthier to do to eat a breakfast and then lunch and skip dinner. There were times in my life when I was able to do that, but it's just hardly anybody does that because dinner is such a social event. Okay, <clears throat> CC, are there any Southern chefs who could make natto palatable? Uh, as I told you, I spent the, the early, the morning, half a day looking at K2 and natto was one of the things. And dang, if anybody could make natto palatable, that would be a big deal. That might be Nobel Prize right there. We need someone to say challenge accepted. I agree. Shoppy Sharp. Uh, good to see you, Shoppy Sharp. I've seen your name a few times. Uh, Quincy, yes. Search for Sachin Panda's studies. Oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, the time-restricted eating. I think that's what you're talking about, too, uh, responding to the, to the comment about late-night eating impacting insulin resistance. Um, Tim Schaefer, Blood Sugar 101 is the best. It is a very, very good, and it is a major eye-opener. Um, Stuart Jones, the timing is perfect for me. Thank you. You're very welcome, Stuart. I'm glad you, uh, you're, you joined us, and I'm glad you're you're uh, taking some interest in your health. Joe A7RI, I'll take you up on water fasting. Do you want, do you want to do two, day consec two consecutive days or two separated days? I would do two consecutive days. Uh, I mean, yeah, two consecutive days. I think that's better. Uh, that first day is ten, uh, tends to be the least comfortable. The second day, you're just starting to get into ketosis. And a lot of uh, water fasting gurus would say, no, you got to hit at least that third day because then you are ketotic. I think two day water fasts make a significant difference. It depends on your goals, but, uh, start with the two days. And again, they will be very helpful for you. KBKS Squire, what about, or ESC, what about the arguments that fat causes insulin resistance by blocking insulin receptors? Well, you know, there, that's a great, great question. There's a lot of research that would indicate that uh, fat in the diet uh, causes insulin resistance. We're still clearing out that fog. Here's what I think personally. And, and I've seen, uh, here's what I think. I think that um, the biggest challenge is adding two major macronutrients uh, together. Like when you load up on carbs and fats at the same time that that tends to um, that tends to be challenging for more of a trying to a longevity type of diet. Why is that challenging? Think about it. Carbs stimulate uh, insulin. Insulin has a couple of effects. One of them is to pull blood sugar out of the blood because uh, it, it wants because high blood sugar damages the body and it wants to decrease that blood sugar. What's another impact that insulin has? It stops fat burning. So if you're chronically in a mode of having stimulated your insulin, in other words, your basal insulin is going from a more normal two to four up to where your basal insulin is like 30, 40, you're hardly getting a chance to burn any fat. And guess what? Did you think about there's a connection? You talk about that middle age spread. In other words, how middle agers start to gain fat. Do you think we're starting to gain fat because we're eating more? Could be, but a lot of people, uh, like the uh, Gary Taubes, uh, has made most most of his authoring career on saying just the opposite. Um, we eat more because we're getting fat because we uh, our insulin is um, elevated. That's the hormonal theory of weight gain. A lot of people agree with that. I personally agree with it too. Um, uh, speaking of Gary Taubes and his books, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, a uh, couple of things like that. B.E. Russell's Is Keto Healthy After Heart Attack? Um, I've got several patients that have lost significant weight by cutting carbs post heart attack. Uh, and again, Gosh, what, what portion, 
most of my people, most of my patients are uh, overweight and anything over a BMI of 25 is overweight unless you've got, you know, you're a bodybuilder and um, the majority of my patients are there. So yes, it works. Um, any thoughts on Bulletproof Coffee? Yeah, I actually, um, I have started doing that about six months ago and I've gotten a habit, gotten in a habit of doing that. As you may uh, have noticed, you notice with my spikes, I um, I started my first couple of days on the uh, fasting mimicking diet, the Proline, uh, still um, not having breakfast, um, made sort of a, a, a tea. Um, anyhow, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. I'm getting a little, getting into something that's going to be difficult to explain. Okay, fats plus carbs equals insulin resistance. And I, I agree. That's Tony Tal, uh, Talaferro. Uh, KBK Esquire, thank you for doing this. You're very welcome. It's my legacy thing. I've retired a couple of times, and uh, this time I'm really focusing on uh, getting that uh, message across. Now, by the way, there are, uh, even by very conservative methods, there are, what, 80 million Americans with insulin resistance? Now, the state of California at this point, over half of uh, uh, Californians, 30 and above, have insulin resistance. 90% have no clue. They don't know that they're insulin resistant. And I can tell you from the patients I see, I mean, I get some people coming in that are very sophisticated, really smart, health nuts kind of folks, and they'll tell me, no, I don't have, I mean, again, I've shared that story with John Lorscheider. He was pretty sure he didn't have insulin resistance. And then he shared, he humored me. We got a craft insulin survey and his blood sugar went way up there. Uh, Samiero, great timing today. Okay, thanks. David Jones, ever worry someone's electrolytes might be low or out of balance before trying a water fast? Well, <clears throat> if somebody's not sure why to worry about that, I mean, if somebody's in normal health, I mean, I used to be a pretty avid marathon runner and there are times with exercise and basketball player, you know, two or three, four hours of basketball some days. You have to watch your electrolytes when you're working out, but that's a fairly temporary thing, assuming you replace them. I'm sorry, I don't really get the point. Um, Tim Schaefer, Bulletproof Coffee, use your favorite tasting butter and it makes a difference. Oh, by the way, uh, to finish the comment about uh, that coffee, I use uh, coconut oil. Sometimes I use ghee um, in Bulletproof Coffee um, routinely in the mornings. B.E. Russell, thanks. Thank you for your interest, uh, B.E. Tim Schaefer, we need to test insulin more, Dr. Uh, more Dr. Kraft. Yes, we do need to test insulin more. KBKS, uh, fascinating point about middle age spread. Probably lower testosterone is also related to the high insulin in middle age as well. I do think it is. Uh, taking uh, TRT seems like a Band-Aid. I've seen my testosterone double from low. I do think that the TRT is a, a Band-Aid. Um, we didn't know. A lot of people, of us, a lot of us worried about uh, cardiovascular and other impacts of uh, testosterone re replacement therapy. Um, I don't do it for several other reasons. If, and if I did, I, I won't get into why I don't do it. Um, but there are a series of, uh, tes testosterone replacement, uh, clinical trials, very good ones done over the past five years. They tended to show, um, that it really didn't help a whole lot except for one thing in terms of, um, uh, improving sleep. But that in itself, that answer creates a conundrum also because sleep is so important for insulin resistance and a bunch of other things. So uh, every answer creates some new questions, doesn't it? Andrew Wilkinson, Dr. Brewer, I read a diet book, which I can't remember the name of, but it's at least 60 years old. He said to never eat carbs and protein in a meal together. His most famous advocate was Sir John Mills. Um, that's very interesting. If you, uh, if you think of who it was, um, let me know. I thought you were going to say Banting. Uh, there was a fellow named Banting who, who wrote the first low carb, uh, diet. If you read, uh, any of Gary Thompson's books, he, uh, 
he talks about banting. Quincy ST, I watched your videos on cardiovascular inflammation and how it damaged the intima. Is it possible to reverse the damaged intima to predeceased state? It's clearly possible to get rid of the inflammation. Um, and getting rid of the inflammation basically uh, involves uh, mostly lifestyle stuff. Um, if it's insulin resistance, which it is the vast majority of the time, and most of the time, unrecognized insulin resistance. Um, once you start managing that, the, the uh, cardiovascular inflammation comes down. You can also even reverse plaque. Um, I've got several videos on that. I actually dro uh, dropped my own arterial age uh, by about 20 years. When I was 58, I had my first CIMT, uh, carotid intima media thickness test, and um, it, they measure it and, and report it out often in terms of uh, arterial age. Mine was 74 at age 58. And that was, a, that was really frustrating because up to that point, I've been in preventive medicine my whole life. I taught it at Johns Hopkins. I, and I practiced what I preached. But it was mostly plant-based diet. And here's what was going on. I was developing um, insulin resistance and didn't know it. I was not that clear on insulin resistance five years ago. Didn't have uh, nearly the background that I have now. So yes, you can reverse uh, uh, cardiovascular inflammation for sure. And believe it or not, despite what a few uh, docs will tell you, you can also uh, reverse plaque. Now, not always. It's uh, reversible plaque tends to be plaque that's been laid down over the past couple of years, not stuff that's been stabilized and, uh, and 10, 20 years old. Solidario, Solidario Libertad. I finished a four-day dry fast. It was an interesting experience. Interesting is an interesting word, isn't it? Um, you know what? I wanted to just cover a comment by uh, Nathan Petty. And that was, uh, he said something like, if you go into the comments, it was the comment on one of the recent uh, uh, live videos that I did. And he said, you mentioned you have some genetic markers for cardiovascular disease. Maybe that would be a good um, series. I've got at least half a dozen, maybe more videos on genetic uh, risk factors for um, heart attack and stroke. Uh, you may have heard of uh, uh, Brad Bale and Amy Donine's book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene. If you haven't, it's a great book. Um, they're referring to 9P21. Uh, there are other, there's some others out here, 4Q25. I have 4Q25. I'm jumping to those two, and here's why. There's two reasons. Number one, I have both of those. And number two, they both uh, demonstrate some terminology I'd, I'd like to uh, make you aware of. This terminology is nine means the ninth chromosome, and P21 is the section on the chromosome. So 4Q25 is the fourth chromosome and the Q25 area. I am homozygous for, H for 4Q25, the atrial fib gene. Atrial fibrillation is um, a significant risk factor. I believe it multiplies your risk for uh, 4Q25, I believe. Uh, well, no, atrial fib mul multiplies your risk for stroke by about five, I believe. And I got one for, since I'm homozygous for 4Q25, it means I got one 4Q25 from my mom and one from my dad that were not the wild type or the normal type, but the risk gene. Let's go back up to the top, the, uh, the heart attack gene. With 9P21, they originally thought it was a cancer gene because they were seeing some cancers with it. Then they started uh, realizing it was very much related to heart attack and stroke. So they started calling it the heart attack gene. That was right before Amy and Brad wrote their book. Since then, they have discovered it's um, a diabetes gene a diabetes risk gene. And here's the thing. It's got a gene prevalence of 50%. Now, when you think about each of us has two copies of, a, of all of our genes, or the vast majority of us do, 99.9 .9 whatever. Um, and half of, the, half of us have risk. I mean, half of the genes in the gene pool for 9P21 are risk. Then you realize that three quarters of us have at least one of the 9P21 risk genes. 
Now that would be if there's only one SNP, only one location. The reality is uh, they soon discovered there were a couple. There were a couple of locations now up to like two dozen locations in the 9P21 area, which can increase risk for heart attack and stroke. Um, so once you start getting all of those different locations, each of which where you can get one from your mom and or one from your dad, you're starting to see much more of a curve. With again. Now let's go back to the simple the simple view of it. So if you've got the this gene and at least uh, you got you got fifty percent prevalence, that means you got a fifty percent probability of getting a risk gene from your mom, fifty percent from your dad. So how does that come out just in terms of Mendelian genetics? Well, a quarter of us are going to have no risk genes. Half of us. Well, another quarter of us are going to have two risk genes, in other words, homozygous, if this were just one location. And then half of us in the middle would have one risk gene and one non-risk gene. So we got 75% of us with uh, the risk gene uh, for heart attack and stroke. So maybe that helps give you some perspective in terms of cardiogenetics. Again, I've got several videos out there. If you have an interest in looking at them, um, go to the comment by, I think it was Nathan Petty, um, and read my response. I put, I put links to most of those videos in, uh, I can't find Nathan's comment now. I think it was Nathan Petty. Um, Nathan, please correct me if that's, uh, if that's wrong. Tony Talley of Faro, Fit for Life, Food Combining. Not sure I understand that. Uh, KBKS question. High tech question. Thoughts on hyperbaric oxygen therapy for arterial inflammation? Yeah, maybe high tech, but a real short answer. I've never heard of it. Sorry. Um, uh, what is an acceptable glucose spike after a meal? You really want your blood sugar to stay below 120 if possible. If you read any of Jenny Rule's books, um, she thinks anytime you get over 140, you may be having some burn going on there. I don't agree with any of that. Here, here's my perspective. I, I do want to keep mine as low as possible for as long as possible. And if you think about what hemoglobin A1C is, it starts to make sense. Hemo, hemo, we all know what hemoglobin is. It's the protein that carries the iron molecule, right? Uh, hemoglobin A1C is that hemoglobin that has been uh, glycated. In other words, glucose has linked um, covalently to that protein, and it tends to burn that protein and de or denature it and make it dysfunctional. So the more glucose you have and the more exposure you have with glucose molecule to a protein molecule, the more likely you're going to get glycation. So I, I think it's just a, uh, a time under uh, an amount of time that you, an amount of uh, how high it is. Okay. Stuart Jones. Great. I found the Australia site for Libre. So we've got, I, Stuart, I didn't know you were in Australia. That is fantastic. Well, we've got, I've actually got a, uh, a couple of patients in Australia and uh, one in New Zealand. Tim Schaefer, plaque is most important to stop it from increasing. Stopping the increasing reduces risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't mention that. I'm, I mentioned that. If there's one thing I mentioned, it is this. Uh, think about it. Most plaque, people say, well, I'm okay until I get diabetes, right? No. Plaque is created by insulin resistance. I've met and seen many patients that have had insulin re resistance. Just you go back and there, you look at their labs, a decade, two decades, unrecognized. And it's meanwhile, it's just continuing to cause that um, elevated blood sugars, elevated insulins. And we talked just a minute ago, we just got through talking about the time you have a glucose molecule next to proteins, burning that protein, causing intima damage. Um, the intima passing LDL through it to lodge in the uh, media of the arterial wall, and that is plaque. So yes, um, 
we got 80 million Americans out there with uh, insulin resistance. In other words, they're building plaque right now. 90% of them don't know it. They don't even know they have insulin resistance. A lot of them that have insulin resistance don't know that that means they're building plaque. Now, what's important about plaque? Plaque causes heart attack. Uh, what's the number one cause of death? Heart attack. What's, a, what's the number one cause of disability? Stroke. Plaque also causes stroke. So plaque and therefore insulin resistance are causing most of, of the death and disability in this uh, country. And that's not to mention most of the, well, blindness happens with type 2 diabetes, kidney disease. Um, there's just multiple problems associated with bad glucose metabolism. Nathan Petty, you are correct. I don't know if you're, ta you're talking to Tim Schaefer or to me, but uh, thank you either way. Um, Tim Schaefer, odd thing is there's almost no chance of getting, of getting diabetes too if you eat the right diet. Um, yeah, you, you can still get um, insulin resistance. And that's a major part of, of aging. Um, but uh, if you manage your diet appropriately, I, I feel comfortable even as, as significant and, and advanced as my insulin resistance is, I feel comfortable that I'm, I'm, I'm going to do fine uh, because I'm strict and disciplined about my diet. If I fall off the wagon and start uh, carving it up all the time and porking up and getting big and uh, cranking up my insulin resistance more and not doing anything about it, of course, I'm going to have trouble. Um, Tim Talaferro, that was the answer to the, to the book Fit for Life in regard to food combining. Oh, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Uh, Bart Robinson, really enjoying this discussion tonight as always. Well, thank you, Bart. I appreciate it and clearly recognize you from uh, uh, making comments on the channel. Steve Sapel, hello, Steve. I recognize you as well, or your name. Hi, Doc. Have you taken an OGTT test and what were the results? Also, how much are you exercising and how often? Just curious. Um, I took one uh, last March. And I believe my one hour went up to about 180. Um, I'm pretty sure I have a video on it. Um, a lot of those videos haven't come out yet, though, because usually I'm at least a month ahead in terms of videos I recorded. Um, how, mu how much are you exercising? I, uh, I exercise pretty hard. I used to do a lot, but it was more that long, slow distance. Um, I've always... I, up until a couple of years ago, when the research started coming out about HIIT, interval training and resistance training, I tended to be mostly um, uh, a distance runner. I've run several marathons. I ran one ultra marathon. Ended up walking more than running, but, you know, it was 40 miles in a day. Um, here's what I do now. I have two hard sessions, uh, usually two days apart every week and usually not on my, you know, I do my water fast Monday and Tuesday, then Wednesday I'll do a hard session and Saturday or Sunday I'll do a hard session. The hard session, it starts off with about half an hour of intervals. Uh, and these are mostly on the treadmill. Um, do a five minute, um, five minutes of uh, seven minute mile pace run. Then I follow that with about 20 minutes of six minute per mile pace, uh, one to two minutes uh, each and some and stuff, stuff a little bit slower. That's as fast as I'll get. But that's pretty good for a 60 year old guy. Then I go into resistance training and the type of resistance I tra training I do is called Austrian uh, volume method. You can read about that. Um, what you do is you try to get up to about, you, you look to get up to about 100 reps. Now, that sounds like kind of wimpy. And for most of my life, I have done wimpy level weights or resistance training. But uh, starting about uh, rep number 70 or 80, and you do multiple sets, starting about reps 70 or 80, you start cranking it up to where you should get to where you're at failure um, at the end. I am still not quite so good at getting at complete failure, but I made some significant improvements 
this past Sunday. And I think that's why I felt so bad the first two and a half days of my, uh, of my um, fasting mimicking diet proline. Bambi Abel, Mr. Abel, how are you? Cannot get with the fasting. I just saw this was on. Sorry, I missed it. Well, it, it will. Uh, you can go back and watch the beginning of it. It'll it'll stay on. Fat Tad Rider, I recognize that name too. Hi, Dr. Brewer. Do you have experience with home cholesterol analyzers like the Cardio Check? Are they accurate? Thanks for going live. Uh, thank you for your interest. We do. Um, you know, given I've been a preventive medicine doc for over thirty years. Um, so yes, I'm. I've had a lot of experience with um, home cholesterol checkers. I haven't had any experience really with them um, over the past couple of years. Um, the last time I I had experience with them, they weren't too good. So I would not get too focused on those. And here's another reason: uh, half of people that have heart attacks have a normal cholesterol. So don't get too focused on cholesterol. Cholesterol is not the bugaboo that uh, we've all grown up thinking it is. Thinking it is. Andrew Wil or Wilkinson, Dr. Brewer, what are your thoughts on the carnivore diet? I think um, I think we've got way too much debate about diets. Um, I just learned what the carnivore diet is. It's where you eat nothing but. It's like. Eating nothing but meat. That's what a carnivore is. Um, I think we're omnivores. And I, I think there are certain times and places uh, where plants, plant kind of food is not bad for us. And um, In fact, I was a major plant-based guy up until about four years ago. Um, now, maybe that you might say maybe that caused your insulin resistance. Uh, no, I'm, I'm 62 years old. Um, I think that's about all I'm going to say about the carnivore diet. Um, how to recover from overtraining. I will tell you this. I have never recovered as well from training as I have since I've gotten more low carb. And I don't, I, I've read about that. I'd heard about it. Now I've experienced it. I don't understand it. If, if somebody does, I'd love to hear. hear uh, because I think that's true. Tim Schaefer, an idea for you. I'm going to eat my keto meal, then go to the lab two hours later and get an insulin test. Should give me a measure that is valuable. I think it will. HIIT uh, makes it easy to overtrain. Yeah, you got to be careful with HIIT. Um, you got to be careful with everything. Uh, Bambi Abel, a month long car cardionet monitoring. Oh, only had four irregularities sinus rhythm, tachycardia once at 101. BPM and two sinus rhythm bradycardias while I was asleep. Di diagnosis, hypochondriasis. Um, don't be too difficult on yourself. And he here's one of the things I'll say. Uh, a month long, you know, <clears throat> here's why they're doing it a month long. I'm assuming, uh, Bambi, that you've had some, um, some of that. Or it feels like a, you know, what we call a flutter in your chest. If you've had that, be very aware and very concerned because the number one cause of, of um, or the number one dysrhythmia that we have is by far and away atrial fibrillation. And as I covered earlier and have, have covered on many videos, atrial fibrillation greatly increases your risk for stroke. Now, <clears throat> A lot of atrial fib is what we call paroxysmal. That just means it happens a couple of times and then it goes away. I first got, uh, or I got my first um, icardia. Icardia is a, is a little electrode that works also for your iPhone and lets you, um, the old original had um, electrodes on the back um, of the cover, of the icardia cover. You could put your fingers or your thumbs on it and you could get a rhythm strip. I first got mine five or six years ago because there were several times I, I felt a flutter. Um, I still didn't diagnose it though. Um, never saw an atrial fib. Uh, what, a year and a half ago, I woke up at two in the morning 
and it wouldn't go away. And my heart rate was like 110, 120 up uh, and more. Uh, actually, it wasn't 110. It was, gosh, I can't remember. It was, it was very high. It was atrial fib level. Um, I did have an icardia at that point, checked it, and I clearly had atrial fib. So there's some uh, icardia, I-K-A-R-D-I-A, a live core, A-L-I-V-E-C-O-R. And guess what? Uh, Apple Watch just came out with um, a great way to watch for this. So Bambi, anybody else? Here's the thing. We, we used to do a Holter monitor or a CardioNet monitor, these kinds of rhythm strip monitors for a week. And then we found that people can have these atrial fib episodes months apart. So if you're having those symptoms, I'd get an Apple Watch. I'd get... I'd get an Apple Watch, really. Uh, the, the advantage to an Apple Watch for detecting a fib, paroxysmal atrial fib, over other things is that with the Alive Core and the other types of uh, iPhone electrodes, you have to feel it and then have it nearby and then know how to use it. With the Apple Watch, you've got it on all the time. And so a lot of these uh, atrial fib episodes, atrial flutter is going to happen when you're asleep. And you won't feel it. Sometimes it'll happen when you're awake and you don't feel it. Why do you need to know that? Again, significant increase uh, risk for stroke. And is there anything you can do about it? There's plenty you can do about it. Um, I, I, well, I started to say I won't mention it. Um, if you have atrial fib, you need to look at the rest of your risk. Um, and, well, if you have a, a um, it's it's called a CHADS2 VASC2. And you start looking at the risk that you have for stroke. Um, most of us that are 60, 65 years old and have um, insulin resistance and uh, a couple of other things end up needing to take one of the NOACs, new oral anticoagulants like uh, uh, Apixaban, Eliquis. Uh, I prefer Eliquis for several reasons, but I'm probably getting too deep in that. Uh, Fat Ted Ryder, thank you. That's helpful. Um, thoughts on measuring C-peptide versus insulin. Um, an old friend of mine taught me about C-peptide, a doc down in um, in uh, Pensacola, Florida. I still don't use it very much. Uh, it clearly does let you know, helps you know that whether it's endogenous insulin versus uh, other types of insulin. Um, Maybe more of a question for an endocrinologist. Uh, low carb age uh, recovery, interesting. That was a question by uh, Lucian P. Suzanne Miller, my husband has a CAC, a coronary artery calcium score of 1650, but the cardiologists in our city only test lipids. Do you have suggestions? Um, I don't mean to be blatantly advertising my services, and frankly, I don't have a whole lot of extra patients that I can see, but I do see patients. I've got, I'm licensed in almost 40 states in the country and I have patients in most of those. Now that's a, um, that's a telemedicine type visit, but we do full, uh, full panels of um, uh, cardiovascular inflammation. Um, we di dig deep in terms of insulin resistance because of the several reasons that we talked about uh, today. and. If you characterize my practice at this point, it's finding a whole bunch of unrecognized insulin resistance um, and full-blown and full -blown diabetes. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, in you or a family member seeing me, just go to our website, uh, prevmedheartrisk.com, or you can uh, email um, Michelle at myhealth at prevmedheartrisk.com. Uh, Joe, oh, Joe Riley. Good to, t Joe A7RII is a AKA Joe Riley. How careful do I need to be the HIT? How careful do you need to be with HIT? Um, you can, you need to push with HIT to where you're, now, let me back off for a second because my wife says that I'm the devil when I'm talking to patients about HIIT because I, I say use the breathing as a, um, as a gauge. You should not be able to talk. You should not be able to 
you should not, you should be gasping. Now, so that means that how does an 80 year old that's done nothing but just, you know, his most vigorous exercise is walking. We have plenty of 80 year olds whose most vigorous exercise is walking and they st do start getting into HIIT. I've got a video on that one too. It's one of the old school uh, videos, uh, HIIT for elderly. And uh, how do you do that? Well, first you start walking up a hill. You find a hill to walk up. If you can't find a hill to walk up, uh, tell me that you can't find a, a, um, a treadmill. Now, I think your question was about, do I have to be careful? Of course, you need to make sure that uh, you don't have, uh, have significant risk, uh, immediate impending risk, but um, that's far less common than we might imagine. Which Apple Watch? Uh, look at, for the Apple Watch that has the cardiovascular uh, monitoring on it. Uh, that was from Jammin6816. Actually, I've gone way over an hour already. Uh, guys, I really appreciate your interest. The longer we get on these things, the, the less people want to just take the dive and, and view it later. I'm going to be doing a uh, setting up a weekly uh, live event like this. Uh, again, please go back, find the comments, uh, find this video, put a comment in. Uh, let me know what uh, uh, what time slot would be. A, would you, would you like uh, weekly. If you would be what time slot, preferably not Sundays and see, um, what topics you'd like to cover. Thank you again for your interest. I'm going to close out in stream.